First thing that we do when we make bread is just combine flour and water. Um, and I still find it to be this sort of magical process. Uh, you're taking dust and you're combining it with water and, and it's gonna turn into this custardy, uh, amazing, versatile, crusty, textured, uh, flavorful end result. But it just starts with dust and water. Uh, now we happen to use a little bit better dust because we uh, get the local dust that's grown here in Arizona. We have it milled on stone. Uh, when flour is milled on stone, all parts of the wheat berry are present. Uh, and so that's what a whole grain flour is. When the bran, the endosperm, uh, the germ, uh, they're all present in the final flour. And so uh, a lot of flavor comes from those components of the wheat berry that in white flour are not there. Um, so white flour is just pure endosperm or starch. Uh, white flour is milled in a steel mill uh, and the steel is really good at stripping the germ and uh, the bran off of the wheat berry. Uh, leaving kind of this pure uh, endosperm uh, that's going through this industrial mill uh, and producing really consistent white flour that has uh, scaled with the industrial revolution. Uh, stone milling is something that you have to go back to our entire history of humanity to understand. It's thousands of years old, the idea of taking uh, wheat between two stones and producing flour. Uh, so we're buying the latter, the stone milled flour. Um, there, there is this reemergence of local milling that's happening around the world right now um, in response to this mass consolidation that happened in milling over the last hundred years. Uh, we're really fortunate to be supporting our local mill uh, and we hope that that trend continues. So I'm gonna put, I teared my scale uh, I'm going to take this bucket of water now and I'm trying to get 35 kilos, just over 35 kilos of water. Um, so I'm going to take out a calculator and subtract what I've got on the scale right now. Meanwhile, the next bucket will start filling. Now I have the difference on my calculator of what needs to go in the bowl. This bowl is uh, this is the second mix of the day, so the first mix was the same thing, it was a sourdough mix. We're not uh, doing anything with this bowl in between, it's still got uh, some dough left over, uh, which is fine. That mix just happened and just left the bowl. Uh, so I'm filling up the next uh, bucket of water now. Um, meanwhile, while that's going, we'll grab the first bag of flour. This is our custom blend a flour from Hayden Flour Mills. Uh, so it's a collection of local grains grown in Arizona. When we first started our relationship with them, we bought just tons of different flour. Uh, and it all came in. Uh, we then uh, you know, mixed it uh, over and over again in different combinations. Um, you know, taking a little bit away from one, adding to another, until we we're really, really happy with the resulting bread. Uh, and so uh, the mill, like us, is a younger business. Uh, they uh, are trying to figure out how to bring this amazing stone milled flour into the world. One of their ideas was, well, we have all this equipment that's good for blending. What if we did some of the blending that you're doing in the bakery for you. And that was a really cool day uh, because now we're able to give them some of our recipes uh, for our flour blends and they do it for us. Uh, it saves us time on this side. Uh, just this process of mixing this bread would be uh, so much more arduous with so many more steps if I had to measure out six different flours right now that are actually in this bread. And so as you're watching me go through this process, uh, this process has already been optimized over time. Uh, if you were in here with me a couple of years ago, 
you wouldn't see a mixer behind me. You wouldn't see any any fancy equipment. You would just see uh, a guy in his residential garage mixing uh, a bunch of different types of dust with water, uh, trying to figure out the perfect one. Uh, so now it's nice that it comes in this pre-weighed 50 pound bag. Uh, I've had people ask about the, the bag weights and how accurate they are. Uh, and they're pretty accurate. I mean, it's, it measured right where it needed to. So once we subtract a little bit of weight of the bag, we're where we need to be with this. I think it's, if my math serves me, it seems to be two pounds off. And the thing is, we're mixing a hundred and about 180 pounds of dough right now. I'm not worried about that two pounds. There is a little bit of variance to the 1% degree. But that variance is made up with skilled hands. So if a hydration of a dough is off by a percentage point up or down, everybody's like, what's the perfect hydration? It's not really about that. It's about the perfect handling of the hydration. You can bake with wet dough. You can bake with stiff dough. Uh, you can bake with the dough that suits you for the result that you're trying to get. But you have to be able to handle that dough regardless. Um, we're used to the seasons changing in here. We're used to the temperatures changing in here. We're used to on the fly having to change variables all the time. And that's what baking is. It's understanding your dough. It's, it's uh, folding it and understanding the tension in it in that day and understanding how to adjust your folding to make up for where that dough is on that day. To achieve the strength that you want when the dough hits the table to achieve the fermentation you want when the dough hits the fridge, to achieve the oven spring that you want when the dough gets to the bake room. Every single dough performs slightly differently, and really it's a matter of how good your relationship is with that dough as you're working. So I've got water in the mixer, I've got my first bag of flour, I let that first bag of flour mix a little bit so that there's space for the second bag because we really do max out the mixer. So I'll put this one in now. So my next job with the mixer to grab a little uh, dough scraper, plastic one is good for this. And I'm just gonna prevent the flour from clumping up on the sides. So what will sometimes happen in this spiral is that as it's trying to work through all this flour, some flour just gets partially hydrated uh, and it gets stuck in that kind of clump on the side of the, the mixer wall. And really it never interacts with the hook of the mixer, it just stays on the side. So in order to achieve that velvety dough that you see later on, one of the things that I'll do is scrape down the side. I have a little opening to my mixer cage here, so I'm not really doing anything that I shouldn't be doing. I'm just reaching in where the mixer lets me reach in, and I'm doing so carefully. Uh, I have to understand a couple things when I'm using machinery this big that I'm not going to sacrifice myself to the dough. So if something goes wrong at any point, like if I lose a grip on this, this uh, bench uh, scraper, I'm going to let it go and then I will, I will deal with the dough. I will throw it out and start over. I'm not going to sacrifice myself to the bread, but at the same time I have to do what I have to do to get the dough right, which involves scraping the, the mixing bowl. 
If anybody has any suggestions that has dealt with these spiral mixers longer than me, I'm open to them. You can leave your comments. Uh, honestly, a year and a half ago, we were hand mixing. So when you see me operating a mixer, there are people out there that have operated mixers for years and years and years. They're, they're the people that I look to for, for help and guidance, but really this equipment is just trying to mimic the behavior of human hands. So we're trying to do this gently. I'm not trying to over mix anything. Uh, so right now I'm just trying to get the water and flour to come together. I'm not looking for anything smooth. I'm not looking for anything well developed. So what happens when you combine flour and water is the gluten starts to form. It's a protein that starts to form uh, when flour and water bind. And as you watch a mix happen, you can see the dough go from extremely shaggy, so just clumps of flour, to more and more together and velvety and stretchy. And that's the gluten actually coming into life and strengthening and creating this web that continues to expand. When I'm doing an auto lease, I'm not really going for gluten development so much as I'm going for the combination of flour and water. So I'm looking to see if there's any flour in that bowl that hasn't uh, taken on any water yet. Just looking for white uh, in the bowl, which is progressively turning more of a yellowish color as it interacts with that whole grain flour. Um, now that it's been going for a little while, it's time to get a little bit more scraping going. The dough is transforming kind of in front of our eyes every couple seconds, so now it really is starting to come together and you can start to see the beginnings of gluten forming as the dough hook grabs the dough and starts to pull on it uh, and stretch it more and more. I'm not really trying to go much past this stage. So this is about the time where I'm gonna cut it and the auto lease now happens passively. So we need 20 minutes uh, as a bare minimum for the enzyme release and for the benefits of this particular stage in dough development. Now, why do we do an auto lease in the first place? So when flour and water meet, uh, an enzymatic release happens, uh, the auto lease helps relax the dough but also strengthen it before you add a leaven to it. So uh, you'll notice that this dough strengthens substantially over 20 minutes. Right now, if I grab it, it breaks apart really easy. When we come back in just 20 minutes, you'll be able to stretch it further. By the time it comes out of the bowl, once the leaven and the salt have been added, uh, the dough will already have significant strength and the auto lease really helps kickstart all of this. Uh, it also has an effect on building flavor, which I will bring to you at a later stage when we discuss that. Uh, but it's a really critical step, 20 minutes at a minimum, and you can take this all the way for two hours. So if we had the luxury of time on our hands, we would let every single one go two hours. Um, but we make up again for the lack of the two hours with our hands. Uh, so I'm gonna let this go now, wash up, and move on. Pro tip, in addition to keeping your stations clean and washing as you mix so that your equipment doesn't have to be uh, completely uh, washed dry. Uh, it's nice to uh, it's nice to rinse out the sink too because dough ends up whether you're at home or in a bakery uh, a dirty sink is really easy to produce um, but if you maintain it throughout the day you can keep it clean. I've got soapy water here on the on the left so stuff that's already been rinsed goes into the soapy water and then goes into a sanitizing solution. Before going on this drying rack that we actually built, uh, we, we used treated wood up here because treated wood can get wet, uh, and we just hung Home Depot shelves that's all above the sink. Um, I'm, I'm talking construction, but we're in a residential garage, so this wasn't always set up to do dishes like you would expect in a commercial facility. Uh, so, when we first moved in, it was literally four walls and a few outlets, and try doing any baking with a few outlets. Uh, we first brought power in uh, for the original ovens, and we didn't own the house at the time. 
we're taking this crazy gamble of modifying somebody else's house by adding a bunch of power into the garage, hoping that that would be okay. Uh, and, and it turned out that we were able to negotiate to buy the house a few months later. So it's just things you don't think about when you try to start a garage business. I bought the bakery. I wasn't thinking about when I bought the bakery that I was going to have to be putting in drain lines and stuff a year later into, into my property. It's been about 20, 25 minutes since I did the auto lease. And looking at the quality of my dough, I'm gonna kind of assess it before I start the, the next part of the mix. If I grab it now, look at all of that. It's still breaking here, but notice how much more I could stretch it versus the last uh, bit of stretching that we did. I'm just gonna get my hand wet really quick. Easier to interact with the dough that way. You can see that there's still a, a little bit of clumps of flour, and this is okay. Uh, I started, I had to make a trade-off uh, decision of whether to keep the mix going and developing the gluten or allow a little bit of the flour to incorporate with the rest of the mix. Keep in mind that this is still the middle of the mix, so uh, not having perfect dough at this stage is completely okay. But I've done a lot of the legwork by developing the strength. The strength can't really be taken away now unless I overmix, which is hard to do. A lot of people are constantly worried about overmixing, and all of those people need to calm down because it's really hard to overmix. Um, so we're gonna grab Harriet from the fridge. So this is a full bucket. We measured a full bucket out last night to uh, 11K, uh, 11 kilos for this mix of dough. Um, Harriet is a liquid starter, and right now uh, she is really at a nice level. So. Uh, she's in the refrigerator cooling down so as to preserve this sort of peak level of fermentation. Uh, when, when she was fed, the level that she was at was where this tape line is. And so this is growth that happened overnight. Uh, growth is actually in the gases that, that are built up. Uh, and Meanwhile, what's really happening, it's not about the volumetric rise so much as it's about the cell populations of the lactobacillus and the wild yeast multiplying. As the sourdough starter rises and becomes more bubbly, as the smell is right and you can just, working with it daily, know that it's the right time for it to go in the bowl, we try to trap it at that level by cooling it down as it's hitting that level. Try to get all the starter out of this bucket. Not a whole lot left in here. Nice thing about these dough scrapers is that you can get the bucket pretty clean. Sometimes we can prep ingredients and so we have the weight of the salt in this one quart container and uh, that way we know what it is and just labeling everything is nice. I do a little personal uh, meditation every time I put salt on starter, uh, just reflect on my current mood. Uh, so this is where it all begins. Turn the mixer on. So I'm gonna scrape the side of the bowl again, just trying to encourage the ingredients to incorporate together in the middle. I added the salt right on top of the starter. Uh, a lot of people add water um, at this stage, like they reserve a percentage of the water that they then dilute the salt in and then add it to the mixer. That's certainly acceptable. Uh, since we're using a liquid starter, meaning a starter that's got as much water as it does flour in it, uh, we find that uh, by adding the salt and the starter at the same time, there's plenty of water in that starter to absorb and dilute the salt uh, into the dough. So we don't find it to be all that necessary to, uh, to add the water uh, at this stage. You can see how this dough is just coming together really quickly in the, in the mixing bowl. 
And that's because of the auto lease that we did. So it's only been a couple minutes and that dough hook is grabbing more and more dough with each pass. Uh, and as, as that's happening, I'm basically judging the gluten development. Uh, so gluten is like a spider web of, of protein that's built up uh, in the dough when flour and water combine. And that spider web just gets stronger and stronger and interwoven more densely over time uh, until it starts to break apart. So it's, it's also on a bell curve. Uh, as you mix it heavier and heavier, it gets stronger and more resistant. And then you hit a peak and then this stuff starts to break apart. And, and so that's based on the characteristics of the flour themselves itself uh, but in the mixer the gluten is going to develop we don't want it to go all the way we actually want to finish that development by hand by stretching and folding the dough but I am looking for a decent development in the bowl uh, so that we uh, have a nice strong dough to shape with later on uh, I would say that we need another three or four minutes on this mix so I'm gonna leave it alone for a few minutes what are we going to? 1,500. 1,500? Yeah. So... Because I just drop more shells in. You can sift them out at the end, but if you never practice the double, you're never going to get the double. Like, you gotta actually... I might not get it right, but... No shells. That's, that's you, though. But there was a point in time where I couldn't do this but one hand either. It, you don't have to. I'm, I'm not trying to peer pressure you, but you can develop this. One hand is good enough for me for right now. <laughs> there you go. I can do this. So now I'm going to tear the scale, and I'm putting in 16 loaves of bread into each one of these bins. Uh, 16 loaves of bread equals uh, 800 grams times 16 is 12,800, and that's where I need to be uh, for each bin, 12,800. Uh, why 16? It's really an arbitrary number. Uh, for most of the time that we've been working, we've scaled by hand, and so you can just put the uh, exact amount of dough that you want in your mixer, uh, or, or that you want to be scaling later on in your bin, so you want a comfortable amount for the bin. So you don't want to put too much dough in the bin to where when it rises, it has nowhere to go and, and your bin explodes. One of the most stressful experiences in here is not keeping up with the fermentation and bin starting to overflow. We haven't dealt with that for years, but trust me, in the beginning, we also had exploding bins of fermenting dough. You can see that it's velvety and stretchy as it's coming out. It's just because the gluten's been really well developed, not overdeveloped. We still have room to go. Uh, this is an 80% uh, hydration, and we find this to be comfortable to work with for the flour that we use. Uh, the discussion on hydration is one that seems to be the only thing we discuss as a baking community lately. Uh, you can find more on whether doughs are high hydration, then you can find on the type of grain and flour that that is used in them and i think that i think that there is a trend towards um caring a little less uh, about the water content more water in dough leads to uh really just a different dough characteristic it becomes more custardy um, with with more water uh, as bakers, we have grown obsessed over the openness of our crumb structure. The jury's out on whether our customers even really want that kind of crazy sourdough open crumb structure. Uh, the people that are really sourdough enthusiasts appreciate it. But my customer base is not just sourdough artisan bread enthusiasts. And if a new customer coming to a farmer's market cuts open a loaf of my bread and there are quarter-sized holes all throughout, they are going to go back to Wonder Bread as they spread their jam on their toast the next morning 
and it falls through onto their hands. I think that we have to find balance in everything that we do and the culture that has been developed in the baking world around open crumb structure um, has gone beyond balance and is now in a point of correction. So I think the more important thing to be discussing right now is how much water can your flour actually take? Uh, do you understand the point at which your bread starts to break down and, and the point at which you can't produce as nice of a bread because there's too much water in the dough? And also, perhaps there is a benefit to lowering the water content for the type of bread that you're trying to achieve. Uh, I think it's all about balance. Uh, we really like this level of hydration. We recently made a downward move to this level. Um, and uh, it's been really nice for us. Uh, our customers have also really uh, liked the bread recently as well, I think. About halfway through the bowl, as I go, I'm also scraping down the side of the bowl and just kind of judging how well I did on the mix. If I notice a lot of clumps on the bowl, I'll know I didn't do so hot. This one is coming out really nicely for me. Uh, this dough just feels exactly where I want it. Uh, I'm trying to cut it in really as few pieces as I can. You can still see big pieces in here and you can see that I was sort of laying them down gently into the bin. Uh, all of bread production is, is really in the handling of the dough and I'm trying to be gentle with it uh, so that all those fermentation sites can sort of take off. Uh, yeah, it, sort of relating it to relating it to the, the area that I've been thinking about lately, which is gardening, uh, I think of this early stage of the bread production as having a lot more to do with uh, nurturing a seed than, than uh, it already having a full, full loaf. So you have to be gentle in how you handle the dough and laying it down flat in these sheets allows all these fermentation sites that have already begun to form to stay preserved. So I'm really kind of layering uh, dough on top of itself. See if I can get it down to just four cuts. I'd have to be perfect here. It'll be five this time with a small takeaway. Everything you do can be measured. And I think that the way in which that we have sped up our learning curve as bakers, because let's be honest, we haven't been baking that long, has been through heavy volume, so a lot of practice, but just finding a lot of places to measure. Where can I objectively improve? I may not know exactly where I'm headed in my development. I may not be able to see how well I'll be able to do something three or four months from now that I don't really understand all that well. But there are problems that I have right in front of me that I can address. And so, for instance, the bowl. Uh, you know, am I, am I leaving any clumps in the bowl? Is it coming out smoothly? How many cuts does it take to fill a bin? Can I do a better job layering the dough uh, to, to give it integrity? So in everything that I do, it's just like seeking improvement. Tearing in between, wetting the hands so it's easier to interact with the dough. I use the bowl jog function in the mixer just now to bring the dough to me. Now we're getting to kind of the end here. And so far, I have achieved, I think, a pretty good mix. Uh, there is a little bit of dough 
in just one corner of the bowl. And so I can give myself a rating here momentarily. This last one is going to be a little bit different. It will be a by hand uh, division because it's not going to meet my criteria of 12 kilos, 12.8 kilos. So we will divide this bin by hand and not through our dough divider. And this is what's left in my mixing bowl. My lost value in my mix. Not too bad. Stick these bins. Each of these labels just tells us what's in the bowl. Now the dough's resting and we are going to start the stretching and folding of it. Um, this is where we build strength. So right now we have the blocks of dough that I've cut um, as I was putting them, taking them out of the mixer. Uh, the dough is, is sort of in a, if you will, the shaggiest stage that it will be in for the rest of this process. We're gonna bring it into a smooth kind of one piece and it will stay in that smooth one piece for, for the duration of its life in the bin. In, in a little bit, we're going to fold these a second time while folding the, the round that we just mixed for the first time. Uh, and we will build strength in, in, again, that gluten structure and the dough structure with each and every fold. The rabbit hole of all baking right now seems to be how big can we make the holes in the final bread? And I don't know if it's like, maybe it's, all of us bakers that are really trying to stick it to the person on the other end that doesn't understand how hard it is that we work to create this bread. I don't really understand the obsession because it does seem to take away from the value of the bread once the holes are so big that really all you can do with the bread is like a tartine style toast. And I'm not trying to take away from the tartine loaf because it's really like created a movement in bread. Um, but I am, I suppose, throwing in my weight behind balance again. Uh, I think that what tartine the brand did so that the tartine loaf is associated with this like higher hydration is remarkable. And I think that that type of baking is highly skillful and requires a lot of, of effort. Uh, I just think that more bakers should look at other techniques of making bread because there's plenty of that going around in the world and the people that are doing it well should, should continue the pursuit of their craft. Uh, I do think that there are people though that would trade local whole grain flour for white flour in their bread just so they can have an open crumb structure. And I think that's the point at which you have made a decision more for your own pleasure as a baker than for the resulting bread that, that we have to remember is a form of nutrition. So I'm folding this, this dough now. This is the first fold for the dough that we uh, mixed earlier today. This is the smallest bin. It's the by hand bin. There's only a few loaves of bread here. You can see how stretchy this dough is right out of the mixer. It's uh, it's going to resist more through this process. So I'm giving it a few stretches in every direction. I like three, uh, but I also sometimes just read the dough and I'll add a fourth or take one away. I'm trying to stretch it to its breaking point. So it's not going to take any more stretching than, than what I gave it without breaking. I'm not breaking that gluten. I'm actually trying to strengthen it. And I can just already tell that we're in for a really nice dough today. Um, I think we're gonna be really pleased with the final result. So in between each fold, I'm wetting my hands and I'm trying to get actually my arms wet because it's not just my hands that are interacting with the dough. Again, I'm not grabbing at the dough so much as I'm scooping it, stretching it upward, folding it over itself. 
generally batching things is where it's at. I saw somebody comment on one of the videos that if they moved as slow as I did, that, uh, that they'd run into some trouble or another. Uh, I guess I have the luxury of moving a little slower because I have people that I've built up over time to support me and I'm not in here by myself anymore, which I was. And at that time I wouldn't have been making videos. I would have been focused on making bread, which I advise that person probably should do if they don't have help around. You gotta move quick in, in bread baking. It's true, that person has a lot of insight in knowing that this is a low margin product. We have to make a lot of it in order to make a living. And we've gotta move quick through task after task. I think it's why it's rare to find people talking about bread making. We're all in the weeds. We're all struggling in our garages, 120 degree weather. It's hard to get to this point We've had to do a lot of building to get to this point. So I'm just gonna mark off that these bins have been folded one time. Oh, I see what Logan does here. You do half the X. Smart. Saves four seconds. We'll take the four seconds of saving. We're gonna go through folding the first mix and it's on its second fold now. Okay, I'm grabbing the first set of bins from this morning. It's working sets of three. You can almost just see it. Even the untrained eye can see that this dough looks a little different already. It's had more time since it was mixed. It's further along in its journey. You can see these big bubbles, which is kind of fun. It is totally okay to pop the big bubbles if that gives you a little bit of joy in your day. So again, I'm gonna go through and fold these. You'll notice that the, well, I notice that the texture of this dough is different. I can feel all the gas that's already trapped in the dough. So it has a different characteristic to it as I fold it. And one of those characteristics are that it just has a little bit more resistance and wants to hold its form a little bit better. It's not all the way there. That's why we're doing another fold on it in a little while, but it's getting closer. So you can now see in the bowl or in the bin how that dough is holding together and really keeping its shape. That's just because it has been strengthened through this folding process. Uh, and so what we're really just doing is taking that developing gluten, that developing protein, and we're teasing more strength into it. Uh, we don't really use much to grease the bins, a, a little bit of oil, uh, but I mean a tiny bit of oil for the amount of dough that we're throwing in the bin. And so as you fold, the bins don't have quite as much grease. Uh, so it's important to move the dough off the sides before you fold it. Otherwise you will tear the dough and you won't get this kind of beautiful velvety uh, result. I'm really caring to not disturb the fermentation that's happening in this dough, I'm trying to handle it gently, so I'm not, I'm not trying to put a lot of compression on the dough itself, and I need to sort of respect it, not pop all the bubbles. So yes, it's completely okay to pop this bubble, but that doesn't mean that you should go popping every single one of the thousands of bubbles in here. You gotta be gentle in your handling, so I'm gonna free it up from the sides, lift, and fold over. I swear half the progress comes from just a lack of anxiety about the whole process though. Because in the beginning you would sort of stare at your dough in the bin. 
and hope that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. You're following some sort of a timer that was on your recipe. Uh, I must let it be in here for three hours exactly. Not three hours and 10 minutes, three hours. And so when your day is ruled by time, only when it's not ruled by time with observation, uh, it can be a really stressful day just going around from one timer to the next. It's better to know what can take a longer amount of time. And that only comes through understanding of what you're working with. We have all of these bins of bread uh, that have been bulk fermenting now. You can look at the level in these bins and I can already see just at a glance that, that the dough is where I want it to be. It's risen enough. It's got enough gas build up. These are ready to scale out and make into loaves of bread. We're going to tackle these as a group and it's gonna go quick. It's gonna be fun to watch. Uh, there's really nothing like watching a, a group of bakers process a lot of bread together. Um, it makes you wanna shape bread and get faster and work in a group. Here we go. Dough's coming out of the divider today really nicely. It's not breaking on me. Uh, it's coming out pretty smooth. We're immediately putting flour on these loaves. The goal is to bring them out of the divider with some tension already on the surface so that we don't have to go and pre-shape. Uh, in the past, we pre-shaped every single one of these uh, and it was because the, the surface tension wasn't quite there. I'm gonna fold over the top and proceed to stitch. So with stitching, I'm just taking these stretched edges and I'm going to sort of weave them back into the center uh, with a little bit of overlap. And then I'm tucking and rolling at the end. So tucking and rolling is just a term for shaping where you roll the, the dough inward and create tension as you do. So now I'm using my thumbs up against the table and creating tension so that this loaf uh, holds its form and passing down the line where it will be put into rice flour and then, and then put seam side up into the bannetons. And this one is ready. We got more bread ready to go. This is sort of a fantastic magic that uh, you can find secondhand on auctions. Uh, you have to be willing to repair stuff because this unit did not come in fully functional. We added this latch. There's literally like a door latch on this unit that keeps it up because it was broken to the point that this tabletop drops. Nothing that a little, little podunk latch won't fix. So in context, this is exactly twice the amount of sourdough loaves that I did solo on Monday uh, when I work in here solo. Uh, and at that level, it's nice to have a couple helping hands on the table, especially. This dough today just feels really nice. It's pillowy, it's soft, uh, but it's still holding its structure and it's it's strong and, and that, I have a really nice gauge of that when I use the dough divider. So I can see how awfully or well it comes off the divider. When I can get these like square rectangles almost, uh, it's pretty nice. These are, these are just as smooth as anything I could achieve pre-shaping and by avoiding that whole step of pre-shaping, we save a lot of time. Wheat in its most raw form uh, when it first arrives to us in the form of whole grain flour. It has anti-nutrients as just a part of its genetic makeup, phytates, lectins, uh, things that your body really doesn't enjoy as, as the wheat goes down the hatchet. Uh, also, unfermented gluten is stronger and tougher and, and doesn't digest as well in your body. So uh, with long fermentation that ha happens through sourdough uh, bread, uh, we're neutralizing the anti-nutrients that are present in wheat, the phytates and lectins. Uh, we're also making the, the nutrients that are available in the whole grain flour more bioavailable. 
Uh, sourdough bread that's been long fermented is lower on the glycemic index. It's just generally easier for our bodies to take in. So a lot of people that have trouble with bread, where when they eat bread they feel bloated, uh, they don't feel all that well. Uh, those same people can eat sourdough bread often with no consequence. Uh, and so we, we get this as just a regular thing amongst our customers. They discover our bread at a farmer's market and just experience so much joy that they can uh, eat bread again. Um, where for years maybe they had to really cut back because the way that bread made them feel. Turns out that it's not the bread itself that's the culprit, it's the process. And it's the selection of wheat. It's all the stuff that's happening uh, in the details. I wish that I had the ability to give everybody an explanation of what sourdough actually is uh, when they're coming up to the farmer's market booth and it's a busy day, there's a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people just really don't quite understand the fact that sourdough is not a flavor, but rather it's a methodology in making bread. Uh, and it's, it's really making the choice between fast bread production with commercial yeast or extremely slow production with a sourdough starter. Uh, the leavening power of a sourdough starter is very small in comparison to commercial yeast. Uh, with 10 grams of yeast having the equivalent leavening power of 50 kilograms of sourdough starter. So you literally need several buckets of sourdough starter to match a dusting of commercial yeast and leavening power. What this means with bread is that uh, yeasted bread just, firm, just goes a lot quicker, it rises a lot quicker. And so that two hour interval from mixer all the way to oven is sufficient for the bread to rise, but it's never sufficient for the wheat to actually ferment. So when you're eating that yeasted bread, you're getting a higher dosage of phytates and lectins when you're eating a whole wheat bread, for instance. Uh, you're also getting gluten before it's really had a chance to be broken down at all and so it's tougher, it just goes through your system harder, uh, leaving that feeling of bloatedness that comes from eating bread. The easiest way to experience better bread is just to find your local farmer's market uh, and, and find a baker like this. Beware that even at a farmer's market uh, you might find bakers that aren't quite baking in this way. It's a lot easier just to buy yeast and, and do, it, do it fast. But if you're going to buy artisan bread, I think sourdough is just a really compelling way to go. Uh, I think you're getting something that's a lot closer to what you're seeking when you buy a sourdough bread. How many people come up to us at the market and think that, have like a preconceived notion of what sourdough is right when they're walking up? People are buying sourdough at the grocery store and what they're buying is something that's called sourdough but is a completely different product in, in its entire makeup. It's just regular bread where they then pour uh, lactic acid into the bread to flavor it sour. Lactic acid is supposed to be the same thing as the lactobacillus that's naturally occurring in my sourdough starter that multiplies that has its own unique flavor profile. Problem is when you just concentrate lactic acid and dump it into dough, you create something that is artificially sour, but not something that's actually genuinely flavored. It's more of an artificial flavor at that point than something natural. And so people who are buying sourdough bread from the grocery store, the not real sourdough, are getting misguided. Uh, they don't really know whether they like sourdough or not because they're eating something that is called sourdough that is not historically sourdough at all. We're moving through our stack of, of dough. Uh, we're processing something like 16 loaves of bread probably just every couple minutes right now. So these 240 that we have to get through shouldn't take too much longer. We're going to switch in the middle to sandwich loaves, which we're about to do. I think I only have two bins left of this first mix. We went from a simple dough, flour, water, salt, and starter uh, in, the, in the local sourdough to this enriched dough. And in this way, you can understand really why enriched dough is called enriched dough. It really does look like it's more rich. Uh, you can see how smooth and velvety it is. Uh, it's, it's definitely showcasing uh, 
the extra ingredients, the inclusions that were added uh, to make it different from that arson bread. Uh, I love talking about this bread and, and giving its story. So I think it's, and we actually have both on the table right here. So you can see the two side by side. You can see that like the butter and the milk and the dough uh, created more smooth uh, final dough, whereas this one is more airy. And so this dough will not uh, have these open pockets that are associated with sourdough. Although again, this is a sourdough dough. There is no uh, chemical leaven. There is no, there is no commercial yeast. Uh, it's just our sourdough starter. And the way in which you can make this bread sourdough is just simply by following the correct rhythm for sourdough. Uh, and I think that's all really that it boils down to is having a nice starter that you've taken care of, because that's a big part. There is a fair amount to know about managing a sourdough starter. You have to know when to feed it. You have to know when to mix with it when it's peak maturity. And you have to have the discipline to continually care for it, even when you don't feel like it on a particular day. So that makes it challenging to keep a sourdough starter just purely from that standpoint. Uh, but aside from that, you can do whatever you want to do with a sourdough starter. And I, I think we have been a showcase of that. Uh, between the croissants, the sandwich bread, the English muffins, the, the artisan loaves, and, and all the things that we cut uh, recently during the pandemic to simplify our menu. Uh, we make danishes, we make breadsticks, uh, cinnamon rolls, uh, baguettes. Uh, of course, then you can get into different grains altogether like rye, which also can be naturally leavened with unique starters that are based on rye. Uh, so sourdough bread is sort of endless with what you can do with it. It's a tradition that spans uh, thousands of years. Uh, so leavened flatbreads of the Middle East pre-1850 would have also been leavened with a sourdough starter because yeast wasn't commercialized until 1850. That's another one of those like isolations in a, in a lab and being able to take this one particular uh, strain of, of a microorganism and replicate it and concentrate it, that's what yeast is. It's a shortcut in, in and of itself. Um, and it's not that it's a bad shortcut, it's just that it really takes away from fermentation, which makes it problematic. These UFO loms are a graduation from this horrendous innovation. So. <laughs> Uh, typically the razor blade goes onto this piece and as you're working with it you have the whole razor blade expo exposed. It's precariously bent apparently so you can, I don't know, carve an angle. No one likes these things. No one. I, I have not met a baker that loves loms. So uh, Wire Monkey makes these really cool uh, UFO loms. Basically the, the razor just uh, fits onto two wooden circles that, that you put together and the bottom of the blade isn't exposed anymore so it's a lot easier to get fine-tuned control. Uh, this is Emerald. She is our resident baking artist. Uh, I say baking artist because she's taken scoring to a level that I no longer really belong in here. I've been working on Mondays on my own in here trying to graduate my own scoring to a level acceptable uh, amongst baking artists uh, like Emerald. So she's actually going to give me some instruction today on how I can get more artful uh, ornamental scoring patterns in the loaves. So in addition to the functional scoring, which produces the ear, we add design. And the whole purpose of this really is to be a reflection on all of the intense intricacy that happens inside the loaf. The, custom blend of whole grain flour. You can't really visually depict whole grain flour you, or stone milling. Another steam. Oh, these are done. I'll pull them. So we've got loaves coming out of the oven right now. These were all scored by Emerald. The color on them is really nice. It's a, a regular discussion of color uh, is always fascinating and seemingly endless. So 
we aim for for enough color uh, to where you actually end up with a crust. Uh, and that means that those edges uh, that lift up into the ear uh, singe a little on the sides, create a little char. And we find that to be a really excellent flavor in, in bread. Anything that isn't quite this dark uh, loses its crust, loses the caramelization, loses a lot of flavor. I understand not everybody is for crusts, and there is bread for that. Um, there's croissants for that. There's anything soft for that. Uh, crusty bread is meant to be crusty, so I'm not trying to make it something it's not. And we're trying not to deflate the loaf too much while we do this, right? Yes. I, I can tell that this particular dough is a little bit uh, soft. It, would you agree with that? Yeah, it's been sitting out the longest. This is the last of the bread I've been baking on this feed rack. Hey, look at that. Is that all right? Yeah. This looks a little... That, that's a good tulip there. That's a good tulip? Yeah. You're, I've... You don't need me anymore. <laughs> Throw steam down on them right away. We close the damper that, that closes the chamber of the oven so that the steam traps in that oven. And we just released eight seconds of steam all in, all in that button push. Again, a luxury that we had to earn over time. It didn't start there. It started with manually steaming the oven um, through spray. You can also at home take a, uh, a metal water pan. You can fill it with water and put it in the back of the oven and generate steam that way in your home oven if you don't have a Dutch oven. But the Dutch oven actually replicates this process. So if you're baking at home with a Dutch oven, you can preheat that oven closed take it out, load your bread onto it, and, and put the lid on for the first 20 minutes, and the steam is actually trapped in that Dutch oven so you can bake in your home uh, oven, one loaf at a time, maybe two if, if you can configure them in there. Uh, so we, we get a little luxurious here with a steam-injected oven, uh, and, and all of this is sort of just to ease our consistency because as you can see, there is a lot of bread going out. Uh, from from the bakery today uh, and this is a midweek day uh, for a Saturday there's there's significant significantly more uh, you know coming out so the way in which we can achieve consistency is having an oven that traps the heat and the steam and then loaf after loaf has a nice consistent ear beautiful color uh, and it's really great to eat so this is a really uh, nice looking loaf of bread we have this center char on the ear uh, a really nice color variation from light all the way to this darkest of browns. You can see a sheen in the crust. That's what the steam did. Without the steam injection, the crust would actually have an ashy color to it and ashy quality. This loaf has now been sitting for a couple of hours, so it's had a chance to cool, and you can hear that uh, flakiness to the crust. I'm gonna cut it, and you're going to get a crumb shot we can sort of analyze the crumb together and get all baker nerdy. So here is the crumb of my loaf. What I'm looking at is the fermentation itself. So now I can actually visually see all the fermentation sites. And what I'm noticing is a little bit of irregularity, which is what I want. And that happens through the stretching and folding. But I'm noticing a fairly consistent uh, fermentation that's happening throughout the loaf. Uh, a lot of crumbs, as people are learning to bake bread, will burst at the top. So you're gonna get a huge open set of cavities towards the top and you're gonna get density up at the bottom. That's what is known as a fool's crumb. And actually you can look at Trevor Wilson's work uh, called Open Crumb Mastery. Uh, there's an ebook available where you can read several hundred, hundred pages on basically achieving an open crumb structure to the level that's appropriate for your bread. It was very handy to me early on. Uh, but the, the key takeaways in fermentation are you don't want that fool's crumb. You don't want to have a false sense of confidence that you're getting an open crumb just because the top of your crumb burst in the oven. That means you had a lot of energy built up in the dough still and you probably under fermented it which is why the rest of it wasn't opened up at all. Uh, you got this kind of dense 
uh, dough mass at the bottom, uh, that dough hadn't fully fermented uh, to an optimal level, but there was a lot of energy stored up. So when it hit the oven, the top of it burst open with all that energy release. Uh, and yes, you got an open crumb, but you also got a dense open crumb. So the eatability of that loaf of bread is not uh, as good. Um, I'm not going for any more openness than this. I could slice this and we might as well talk about slicing bread. A lot of people struggle with slicing these type of loaves of bread. It's really nice to have a good bread knife. This type of bread knife shouldn't cost you more than $60. And that's a lot of money to spend on a knife. But if you like hard crusty bread that's soft on the inside, you will be so thankful for your own investment every single time that you slice open that, that loaf of bread. And with a nice knife, I can cut decent slices. You can see that this slice is still suitable for jam or for whatever application that I want for it. Uh, it the holes aren't so big as to not be able to spread something on it. And that's what I'm definitely going for. In cutting the loaf of bread, I also cut it in a particular direction. So I had the full loaf of bread and typically most bakers will, will score down the middle and produce an ear that, uh, that opens up in this way. This is a pretty classic artisan loaf. Uh, if I cut this way perpendicular to the ear, I'm going to get a pretty nice uniform slice of bread that's still suitable for a sandwich if that's how I want to use it. Keep in mind that this bread is not by design sandwich bread. Uh, so it's not going to be the exact same shape as the square bread that you find at the store, but it's still a really nice slice for an artisan sandwich. You can stick this in your toaster. Uh, I'm going to cut a matching slice. And so now I have something that goes together pretty nicely. Uh, this would make a mean sandwich. Uh, this particular level out of the oven today, you really don't need to toast it unless you want a little more strength in the bread itself. I like to use the ends of this loaf uh, creatively as well. A lot of people will cut maybe just to this portion because once you get kind of to the end, you end up with these smaller chunks this would be a shame to throw away. It's really great bread. Uh, you can use this to dip in soups. You can use this for smaller slices. Maybe your kids want something smaller. You could create a charcuterie board with this. The limit to what you do with bread in an oval shape is really the limit of your imagination. If you don't know what to do with the ends of your loaf, look online for some tips. There's certainly tips from more creative folks than myself.